Um, today we're going to talk about uh, design and modeling with MySQL, but design and modeling for databases, uh, MySQL and Postgres. So, uh, you know, it's, it's put it this way because this is a, supposed to be MySQL track, but uh, it applies for Postgres and other databases. Uh, we'll we'll uh, go through that, but before that, if you haven't connected, uh, we can connect. Uh, it's, my name is on the uh, schedule also, or you could uh, send me a request on, on LinkedIn. And uh, my name is Alkin. I work in um, <coughs> Sista Data. Some people call it Chista, and uh, I'm the EVP of Global Services, where I actually handle uh, customer uh, interactions and, and uh, run a team of DBAs, uh, focusing on <coughs> ClickHouse uh, on analytics. Previously, I was uh, working in some of the services companies like Falcona, Pitian, and um, uh, PlanetScale, which uh, we talked about in the previous call. And uh, in my previous uh, life also, I was an enterprise DBA. I worked on Informix, uh, Oracle DB2, and SQL Server installations uh, worldwide. So um, a couple of things that I've done in the past, so we'll skip that. And um, this is where I work. Uh, why I put this over here, we're still hiring, so if you're interested on uh, getting your workloads on MySQL or Postgres uh, slimmed down and uh, want to run some analytics, you can actually tr give it a try on, on ClickHouse. And uh, ClickHouse, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but ClickHouse is a columnar-based database, which is outside of the context of this talk. So I uh, won't get into that, uh, but check out the sister data. IO or sisterdata.com for the blog post and the information. There's also a DBAS that you can go, go ahead and sign up and, and try. All right, so as a captain and a sailor, uh, I have to put in one maritime uh, slide for every uh, talk I make. So today's trivia question to the audience is, what is the name of this device or instrument? Does anyone know? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, you got, uh, you got a beer from me. So it's called uh, sextant. Uh, it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, uh, don't think that way. It's an instrument um, to calculate, calculate an angle between the two objects. Uh, and then it's, it's literally used in, in 1800s for uh, navigating in the seas, for uh, getting the, um, um, horizon and the object could be a, a, a star or anything else. And then there's a little bit of a uh, calculation behind it, latitude and longitude, and you can find where you are, basically. It's difficult, I have one, never used it. I don't plan to use it, maybe when I retire, but uh, <laughs> it's something uh, is out there. So I, I bought it just to, you know, it's nice. <laughs> but uh, with, it, with the modern uh, technologies, we use GPS and, and everything else uh, possible to navigate and uh, for forecasting weather and everything. We have very complex and, and advanced systems to do that, but it's nice. So thank you for uh, the answer. Uh, also, I ha actually we had a, a lot of um, discussions around the community. So my SQL community, as you can see, the room is not that uh, full. Maybe the, there's a little bit of a split. I have uh, taken uh, some time to write a blog post about the community, how can one contribute to a community. And um, basically, I wrote it for MySQL uh, because I come from the MySQL community, but you can contribute to any other open source database or other open source uh, communities. And um, please take a look at it. The slides, uh, we will share those so you can uh, basically get the link. All right, now that we have hopefully broken the ice and uh, we can look for the agenda. So today's uh, subject is database design and, uh, and uh, We'll cover some of the scaling and scalability options that we have. Uh, some of the previous talks already covered for Yugabyte and uh, for Planet Scale, for Vitesse, and I will also touch base those. And there'll be a, another talk after this uh, covering the Thai DB. Um, and then we'll talk about integrating databases and then emerging trends, which is, which is going to be the, the uh, distributed databases where we can actually, if we have time, we can actually talk, talk about or open, open discussion over here. So I'll try to keep it uh, light and not boring because database design and modeling is sometimes you don't uh, get to do a lot because when you end up in a, in a company as a DBA or a developer, there's already some sort of a database and it's built by um, 
uh, some tribal knowledge. Sometimes it's the business uh, requirement comes in uh, fast and quickly that uh, you, it's, it's actually taken as a scratchbook and then it became a, becomes a huge large database which is problematic at, at the end because you're there. Uh, as a DBA for the last three decades, I've ended up in many places with the same problem. Sometimes I did contribute to a, a design of a new schema or new database, but sometimes we had to uh, deal with the existing design, which was a problem. So take a look at the history of the data model. So I come in somewhere in, in a bit between over here, but uh, basically um, uh, the, the, the models that emerge on the, uh, in the 70s, they were like the network model. And then, and then the network model was, was basically uh, flat files and, and reading uh, large uh, files into like a database, a data store, one by one, sequential. Uh, some might know that if, they, if you worked in, in, uh, in like COBOL era, RM COBOL era, uh, there was like a files in the, and it would just read and um, maybe with sim simple index or not even a, uh, libraries. The libraries came maybe a little later, the, the ISM, uh, CISM li libraries, um, and then which became part of the MySQL originally. That's again about 30 years ago. So the relational model born in the, in the heart of uh, the, when the databases actually became more like a, a requirement for the businesses and, um, and uh, yeah. Okay. And um, what we're saying is uh, relational databases uh, became dominant in, in 80s and the 90s we uh, faced the object oriented programming which actually came with the object uh, databases and uh, in 2000s we started having graph databases and now we are on uh, the white column stores, NoSQL era of uh, the emerging technologies in this era. So ClickHouse is one of those, the column store which actually is opposite of the role-based system, which we will talk. If you look at this uh, history, the emerging technology from the inception of the database or the, the data model to becoming a commonly used technology, it takes about 10, sometimes 15 years. So yes, the relational databases became in the 80s, but uh, businesses, most, most businesses actually started using Oracle Informix DB2 or UDB DB2, uh, even SQL Server in the late 90s or mid 90s. Okay. And because of the popularity of the relational model, uh, currently it is still the most common used uh, with a 60% and there's also the other models that were used in, um, in the model. Uh, if you see a uh, hierarchical uh, network and object-oriented model, they actually um, don't actually take as much space as the relational da database models. But um, I think this list can be upside down in, in coming years, maybe uh, the introduction of the microservices and splitting up the data and the data models are, are uh, slightly changed. Within those, their still relational model still exists. So if you, if you look at the uh, relational model, as, as we all know, for MySQL and Postgres, they're all organized in their tables and it's row based and each row actually has their attributes and then uh, th there are keys around it. Um, we won't get into the keys on this talk too much. It's a separate talk, uh, keying, indexing, optimization of queries, all that is a separate uh, subject. But this is, sorry, uh, this is the foundation of, of, uh, of the database design. So if you don't have a design that supports your uh, queries and the, and the business um, rules, then you'll have a problem with the whatever database it is. It's not going to be a MySQL only, but also on others. Okay. Um, so one of the concepts that uh, I would like to highlight is, uh, is the normalization. So it's actually directly linked to, to the uh, relational model. Because if you have a relational model uh, database uh, that needs to be uh, normalized, uh, this used to be a, a thing in the early days as we've uh, seen in the history of uh, where it was born. Um, the data on the, on the relational databases, on the modern, uh, the earlier versions of uh, RDBMSs, they were not normalized. So this was a very big requirement to have data normalized and, uh, and then become more efficient 
and, uh, and, and basically consistent in, in its, itself. So, um, so what is a normalization? Normalization is actually ba basically a reduction in, in, in redundancy, avoiding the redundancy in your table. So you don't have the same table repeated, same uh, attributes repeated among other tables. And um, so this improves the integrity. You don't have to go and update multiple tables for it. And then also um, it helps the uh, efficiency and the productivity of the database that you're actually querying. So, okay. So the other thing is this is linked to uh, the relational model uh, is the asset properties. So we have to have uh, atomicity and the consistency and the isolation and also um, the, the data should be durable. So in order to basically do all of this uh, in, the, in the relational model, you need to have uh, all these uh, properties applied along with the uh, database operation. So going back to the database design, uh, when you are thinking of, of a designing a database with, with this relational model, you have to know these uh, properties that the database will offer to you. And uh, MySQL is asset compliant database. So the, what we mentioned in the new era of databases, some of the uh, emerging technologies like NoSQL uh, or columnar uh, databases don't necessarily comply with asset properties. Hence, they cannot be used for transactional purposes. And also the infamous uh, cap term. And uh, uh, so along the lines of asset properties and, uh, and the database uh, design, you will actually have a, a, a problem to deal with is the, is the uh, consistency, um, availability, and the partition tolerance uh, subjects. So we have to uh, make sure that these are, these are also Align with the database design, which is uh, the relational model in this case. Also, uh, you're complying with the with these with these with these three. So, I will get to where MySQL stands in here. But again, the the cap theorem actually isolates the availability, partition tolerance, and consistency. Having these three, it's actually um, I give this example to. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, Think about you're, you're in a rest, you went to a restaurant, restaurant has uh, a, amazing food, uh, and the restaurant uh, you go is, is a, has a beautiful view, maybe you're on a seaside or a lakeside, and, uh, and, uh, and the bill is very cheap. That is not possible, this is what it says. So if you compare it to that, uh, having all these three within the same database, you will have a problem uh, with your database design and the model. So how does this happen in the NoSQL world, which is, again, outside the, of the context of getting into that, but knowing these are the, the properties of the theorem, uh, you will actually have uh, NoSQL having an, an uh, optional um, workarounds for that, such as eventual consistency. So you will have a database. It will be consistent, but not immediately. So you can't do uh, um, read over write, like you can't, you can't do certain things. So make sure that you are in that, in that sense because what we have seen in the last decade is um, specifically on MongoDB world, it, it actually had, um, or, or some of the other databases like Cassandra were used for uh, relational model mapping, but it didn't actually work the way that it was supposed to. Um, this was uh, a proposed uh, by, by Eric, and, um, and, and, and there are trade-offs be between the uh, properties, so you will actually have to make sure that um, your, your trade-off is, is, is satisfied with the design. Okay. For the data models, we have a couple of key terms, um, entity, entity relations, uh, the attributes, and the, and the relations between the entities. Uh, so these are the things that maybe the new generation of uh, developers or, or DBAs or, uh, don't actually pay too much attention, 
but uh, if you have a, a proper uh, design, uh, these are the things that you will be actually having. So the other models are hierarchical model. For example, it's a, a top-down uh, model, and um, you will have no relation between the bottom uh, of the uh, entities to the top. It will be only one way around. Uh, the network model was also popular we, in the earlier days, and it's no longer a thing. Object-oriented model is, is still a popular thing uh, to be considered, and uh, because the object uh, relational model is still applied within the object-oriented programming and object-oriented uh, ORMs that will actually uh, apply these. And then there's the relational model, which is somewhat uh, satisfies with the relational database management systems, uh, database properties, and then there's also entity relationship model. So uh, basically you would have um, a couple of um, examples, for example, customers order shipments. Uh, they, you can have a one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many relation, and visualize that, make sure that uh, your database is designed the way it's supposed to have, and nothing is redundant, so you'll have to actually have apply the normalization, um, and, then, and then you will actually have a proper database design at the end. Uh, unfortunately, we will not do a workshop over here. I would take it, that would take a long time to do it. I would maybe later on sometime, uh, that would be a good e example of how to design a database uh, from scratch would be an option, but uh, I have a, a quick hint for that at the end of this talk. Okay, so, Let's go back to the uh, entity relationship model. Um, so you could actually have a somewhat entity relationship diagram in order to understand the database, okay? So um, who actually has ever done an ERD entity relationship? Okay, okay, we have few people. Again, I, uh, I mentioned it's not as popular as, as it used to be. Um, I used to work in large enterprise uh, shops where Nothing would go in production without having an ER diagram and then, and then uh, normalization is applied and then there's keys created, verified, checked, and then deployed in. So today we're not maybe diligent as much as used to be in, in the, like large uh, corporations, but uh, the, if you, if you, you know, basically don't do all of these, you are going to be facing a problem at some point in your future uh, growth. Uh, as, the, as the database uh, will evolve over time, which we will talk about a little bit on the scalability and how this gets into a problem of one becoming a one single uh, database into uh, multiples of thousands of, of maybe clusters of database globally. So how do we do this? Uh, we actually gather the requirements, which, which the business is supposed to tell you, okay, this is, we're gonna actually have a new service um, say a new payment system or a new integration to some, some mailing system or something like that. We identify the entities. We make sure that attributes are identified. When this says attribute identification, what does actually uh, ring you on? What is that, what is that actually uh, meaning on the at attribute? Basically, this is uh, the data points. So I think this is another very important point is the data type. So if you don't wanna have a problem in the future, you would wanna make sure that all the data types applied from the beginning properly. So there is a, there is a lot of um, experiences that we faced, oh, this database is slow because, because they used a wrong data type or a wrong uh, attribute, and uh, it actually had a, had a difficulty both indexing, making relations, and, and other problems. So, so uh, we do, we, after all of that, we build uh, ER diagram and then we construct that and then we re re review and, and define. As you build this, you, we actually apply the uh, normalization techniques. And then um, basically the ultimate goal is only uh, having the uh, reducing the data redundancy. In MySQL, interesting enough, there's a tool for that, and it's free, and no one uses it. 
So who, has anyone ever used MySQL? Okay, but you build databases, okay. There's some couple of people used it, uh, but uh, this tool has evolved and improved over the last decade a lot. It used to be uh, uh, very simple and, and um, didn't have all the uh, bells and whistles. The, the last edition that I had downloaded and tested is actually pretty good and uh, it can do a couple of things. Uh, it can do the modeling, which is, the, which is uh, what it's supposed to do. But it does a reverse modeling also. Say you actually have a database and you connect to a database, it pulls out and it gives you the visual relationship model, which is, I think, pretty cool because your database can be small or big, but knowing visually the, the, the relations and how it's built, it would be very good to use this tool to do that. I did search for uh, the Postgres version. There is none out of the box in Postgres, but there, is a, there are a couple of third-party tools that you can actually pull this data. I'm not even talking about the paid versions. And then it does a query. It's a, it's a query editor. We don't necessarily use for queries or the administration in MySQL world. It's always like a, as much as CLI uh, possible. But if you're a beginner and if you're kind of exploring it and there's a way of uh, connecting to a database using Workbench and then it can also do the validation which actually can generate uh, the um, um, between, between the models and, and the entities, it can actually uh, check the validation for the, for the design of it. The other thing that it does, maybe it doesn't mention over here, is actually it can also generate the SQL statement for it. Like uh, you can design a database over here and then tell, tell it to generate the uh, uh, SQL syntax for it. You can take it, copy and paste it somewhere else and then execute it, so it's, it's actually Pretty good, so you don't have to type it by hand. It's a useful tool. So, so we mentioned about the uh, ER diagram and then we, we, we uh, do the, you know, we built a database and then we think that it, it does satisfy the, the need of uh, the business, but then it, we also still need to check about the uh, normalization. So the first normal form, we actually have a primary key for each table and then it actually represents a, a, um, that each row uh, and only atomic values are in it. And then there's a second normal form. So it goes on and on like this up to f uh, fifth normal form, but normally you are around second normal form or the third normal form of, of a table design with the entity relationship. And then this is something it's not mentioned in any of these slides, but there is also denormalization. When it comes to be too broken down into system, again, you have a problem in, I had been in, involved in a couple of denormalization efforts because the table didn't have the, the, the properties of the attributes of, of the data that it needed, so it had to gather from somewhere else, which actually also an overhead for a database operation. So you also want to do, minimize the, uh, the joins and, uh, and uh, maybe even like a bad queries, Cartesian products that, that might be caused by reading two tables, joining the, the, the rows, then, there, then maybe it's too much to have uh, beyond third normal form of the um, table. So this goes to, this, this technique is not intended for a single table. It is intended for the, the, the main relation of the data, data, data point. So um, basically you, you get to the uh, primary keys and then, and then you make sure that you're uh, separated the data to a different tables, but not redundant. And, uh, and then build the relationship and, uh, and then you actually apply these techniques and then, and then you remove uh, the partial dependencies that is not uh, suitable. So um, no non-key attribute depends on just part of a key. So the, if, the, if the, the column, in, in our case, is not a key, should not be part, part of the um, primary key of the table. Okay, so we mentioned uh, originally for the uh, asset properties and, um, and then there is, um, 
part of the asset uh, properties, you also have isolation levels, which uh, again link to the data integrity of our design. So we design, we're designing a database and then uh, we made sure that uh, it is, um, asset properties are, are uh, provided. We paid attention to cap theorem. We did some uh, normalization, but we still have to make sure that our access of the, of the da database is, uh, is basically um, isolated. Uh, why this is needed? Because we have uh, concurrent access to the, to the same data set. And if, if it's changing by different uh, users, different connections, it has to be isolated from the other transactions. And uh, there are different levels of isolation. And um, in MySQL, again, we actually have a repeatable read as a, as a default, which actually works pretty good. Um, I don't want to get into that uh, too much in, in internals of it because uh, it's not part of this talk, but uh, we actually uh, balance the consistency and the concurrency with the isolation levels. And uh, MySQL does a pretty good job doing that until things get uh, distributed, so which, is, uh, which was part of the earlier discussions. Uh, maybe uh, in the next talk also. So we have to choose isolation level carefully and at, at least be aware of there are isolation levels uh, that can be set by a client which may be uh, not in your control. So, all right. Uh, scaling databases. So with, with that said, database, uh, we, we created a model and then we designed a database uh, considering all the factors that we've gone through in the last uh, 20 something minutes. Uh, when it comes to uh, scaling, some of those properties will become um, a challenge. So um, why do we need to scale database? Maybe there's an exponential growth, the business actually uh, booming. And um, so you need to set strategies for the, for the scaling. Whether uh, you would isolate a database per uh, requirement, it could be per region, per country, per, per city, or uh, you would do some other uh, techniques to do that. Basically, um, this is what uh, you will have to consider for both performance, reliability, and the availability. So, Having a database scaled, not available, things falling apart, um, having a latency, we have seen that a lot, and um, that's part of the uh, deal. So there are some techniques um, that we, I will just uh, highlight and overview those. Uh, for example, sharding, uh, there's replication. Replication for MySQL is native, out of the box. Um, Matthias in, in the previous call uh, gave a highlight of those, but if you, if just uh, for those new people, if you weren't in this room before, uh, it does an uh, asynchronous replication out of the box. You don't need to buy or set up something outside of the uh, MySQL itself. Um, caching, and then there's the other, other uh, options in the cloud also that you can scale the databases within the given context of the model. Oops. So we identify two ways of scaling. One is the horizontal scaling, and the other one is the vertical scaling. So um, vertical scaling is a little bit uh, more known method of, of doing it for just adding a new node or a larger node or a bigger node and, and, and then getting that. Horizontal scaling can be a little bit complicated. You may need some other tools. Uh, some other coordinator, uh, some other um, router or, or proxy or something like that. So, so be aware of that. How when you get when you get there, when you need to scale the database, you can't just just uh, keep putting in the largest uh, instance of, of your cloud provider or your home machine. Uh, so, basically, what we are doing over here is expanding the capacity of the database that we designed. Okay. So 
in the in the vertical uh, scaling, we we can actually have a um, couple of options over here. Um, we actually have uh, adding a new node and increasing the CPU. We mentioned that, and um, it's a it's a what it what we uh, take the vertical scaling is a short term solution until we actually have a, a bigger term uh, or a roadmap in our, in our hand to have a, a solution for scaling the database. So don't take the, the vertical scaling as a, as a solution uh, itself. It's just a usually short lived initiative that doesn't actually uh, scale itself. So the, uh, in the previous call also, uh, previous um, talk also, uh, Matthias mentioned a, a proxy solution can be a way of uh, scaling the database. Uh, because out of the box we have replication, but then uh, splitting that replication into, uh, for example, read-write, you can uh, scale the reads with using uh, replicas, and um, and then and then you can use the MySQL replication application hitting that server. There's more complex drawings on on his uh, slides, but I didn't go into that that much of a detail, uh, because these are operational problems, a part of the scaling which uh, I link it to our um, design and model. So you have a design model that doesn't actually uh, comply with this solution, that's not going to work again. So in order to have that, uh, I mean I've seen databases just have one big, uh, you know, terabyte memory, single node database that you can't put a proxy or anything like that. There's nothing you, you can do about it. So. Uh, Proxy solutions are not limited to uh, proxy SQL. There's a MySQL router, open source, uh, and then there's uh, people that's been using, even before uh, these existed, like HA proxy or other, other uh, TCP proxies out there. Um, MySQL has a, a different uh, solution. Uh, there are many cl clustering solutions around MySQL, but one of the MySQL's uh, native solution is the InnoDB cluster, which consists of a group replication um, <coughs> and MySQL router, and also a supporting tooling around MySQL shell. So then you actually have a cluster itself. You can do primary and then secondary is underneath, all, and also you can have a cluster set around it. This is a, another way of scaling this. This could be like US East, US West, and, uh, and mid and then you could actually scale these, connect the, all of them, and now you have a, a, a you know, DB cluster set around it. This is all, all of these, like this, this looks a pretty complex uh, drawing, uh, but all of these are natively supported in the, in the MySQL ecosystem, which is amazing because, you know, group replication is alone a cluster uh, set. It uses, uh, some uh, consensus algorithms. I don't know, uh, again, it's not part of this talk, but there are some known consensus algorithms that to uh, make sure that these actually work and talk to each other and make also comply with the asset properties of, of the database within the relational model. We test, we talked about we test on the previous call also. We test is a, a made for um, MySQL uh, sharding um, framework. And um, it has the similar uh, modules, like uh, it's got the VT gate as like a proxy and then there's a load balancer before you connect the databases and you can shard. Uh, this is basically intended for um, horizontal sharding. So one to N, meaning each shard is itself a cluster. There, is a, there are three nodes in it. Uh, it has uh, one primary and two secondary. And if something happens to this uh, secondary, it just fails over automatically, and then it still have that. Uh, if you're running on this one uh, with an operator in Kubernetes and, and all that good stuff, the new emerging technologies, you would actually have a immediately initialized new host and then, and then um, you know, add it to the cluster. So the, the sharding, sharding framework allows to go pretty much unlimited in this case as, as the limit of your uh, hardware or cloud resources or credit. So, uh, for more, we can check the Vitesse IO. Uh, I have links at the end. Um, 
Before going over to the server list, there is a, a TIDB, which we will have a talk on the uh, next talk, is, is, is that. Uh, there's much more comprehensive information about TIDB uh, provided with the MySQL uh, protocol. Uh, it's, TIDB also solves uh, many of the challenges of scalability on the relational model. Um, so I have a link at the end, but no uh, slide for that. Uh, there are also serverless options. So apart from the uh, manual implementations of the frameworks or the open source tooling, uh, some orchestration uh, done around uh, the database uh, model, you can actually have a serverless uh, MySQL solutions. Uh, within the serverless uh, MySQL solutions, uh, most popular is uh, AWS Aurora. Um, uh, Google Cloud has some solutions around it. Um, pretty much every uh, cloud provider offers MySQL, but not necessarily scalability options. Aurora stands out over there. There's also Planet Scale, which actually uses uh, this technology behind the scenes. And you could actually have a database that can scale unlimited, if that was the, the requirement of the business. And you could still use the relational model with all the other properties, including uh, asset properties and, and the isolation. Um, so these, um, these serverless, uh, what, what do they actually provide at the end is actually serverless uh, MySQL or Postgres or other database uh, Im implementations actually takes off the, the burden of operational uh, t tasks and it, they are all managed, automated by the, uh, by the systems that they, they've been hosted. So they're managed services, managed operations, operational databases within the cloud. Okay, um, so the future of databases. Uh, I think earlier today, maybe you were here, uh, there was a talk on the Kubernetes uh, talk. So we have a, a sub uh, Kubernetes ecosystem called data on Kubernetes. So having stateful workloads in Kubernetes is something that's uh, emerging technology. So you actually integrate with those technologies again, and then you can actually run different workloads underneath them. And uh, one of them is, is running um, an operator. Operator actually uh, runs the database operations for you in, in the Kubernetes and then you can actually have a very scalable and um, I think emerging and, and more modern uh, technology, uh, which can be integrated and adopted to other technologies. So for example, I am running a, a workload that is, that is designed and running on, on Kubernetes, uh, stateless workloads like um, Nginx or any other implementation. Where do we put the database? I mean, database needs, needs to sit somewhere in there, right? Like you can't actually have like a standalone database outside of your uh, operational uh, Kubernetes cluster. So you would actually have to adapt to these new technologies. Maybe it's, it wasn't a good idea five, 10 years ago, but it's, it may be a good idea now. So, um, so you need to actually leverage the new technologies and uh, new ways of, of doing that, uh, which will allow, again, AI, machine learning and all that, all that new, uh, new buzz. Okay, uh, why did we talk about this uh, today? This was uh, the idea that came uh, to me as, uh, from this book. This book, uh, I've been working on this book for the last eight months uh, with my co-author. And uh, this was actually good to go back and, and, and uh, look at how the database fundamentals used to be and uh, focus on that. This is on pre-order right now. It will be released this summer. And um, so hopefully you'll get a chance to uh, read this book and with much more details than today's talk itself. And uh, this was my previous book. Um, this we uh, spent a lot of time on, on about two years on this book uh, together with my uh, co-author Sveta and uh, this also actually has pretty good information. If you, and if you are new to MySQL or you have some challenges with MySQL, among the other uh, set of very good books on O'Reilly, 
uh, you can actually have a take, take a look at this. So I put this one on the here so that people can have an access on uh, the slide deck. And this is it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. Oh, I think we have a couple of minutes for uh, any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much again. Thanks for listening. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Partition, partition tolerance. So partition tolerance is, Sunny, do you want to answer that question? <laughs> He's very good at partition tolerance. <laughs> So you are actually partitioned your connected nodes, but system still operational even that, that connection is, is broken. So um, the algorithms like Raft, Paxos, and some other algorithms that are similar to that, these are like basically computer science uh, algorithms that creates a, a consensus among the nodes. If you have the majority of those, then you can continue. And if you lose the majority, it holds. Some systems actually say, okay, don't, I'm not gonna do anything because now we have a double-headed dragon over here. We may, may cause more problems than it is if the application writes into two, two nodes at the same time. So, split brain. We had that uh, in our lifetime also. All right, any other questions? Thanks, Sunny, by the way. Um, all right, thanks a lot.